Jesus' name. Amen. So thankful today to have Brother Preston Clemens with us. His family is with us, and we're so glad that they're with us. But Brother Clemens has been evangelizing in SoCal, and Las Vegas is part of the SoCal district for a number of years. He just seems to never come through this park. He stays busy down there. And this time, he let me know he was headed through here. And I said, not without me tripping. And I'm glad that he's here today. I, uh, over the last two or three years, I would go to board meetings and they talk about the fresh fire revival they've been having in section one on Friday nights once a month where a couple of hundred people in the last couple of years have received the Holy Ghost on Friday night services when churches just come together. When churches just come together, it's not in one place, but it's when churches come together for a Friday night service to reach the lost. And uh, Brother Clements has been spearheading a lot of that. And I would always get jealous because I was hearing about it. But I was never seeing that with him coming through here. Brother Clements, we're glad you're at Praise Tabernacle today. God bless you. Come and thank you for here today. Clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. I came here thinking I was going to be in a new place where I wouldn't recognize anyone. There's Brother Denny A. there. I've known him for a long, long time. Then I looked out and I said, is that Brother Eastridge out there? Preached for him in New Mexico. Known him a long time. And my good friend, Sister Hernandez. We love the Hernandez. Of course, my kids, my beautiful wife are here today. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Yeah. Well, I say thank you to all the ministry staff and team for letting me come. The first time Pastor Blizzard and I talked about me coming, he probably won't even remember it, but it was in the year of 2005. He said, you know, I think I could fly you in here out of Orange. I said, we're well, revival in Orange. We kind of beat around and everything to make it happen. So it only took me 11 years to get here. But I'm much older and wiser now. This will be your benefit. Amen. Praise God. But the message that I'm going to bring to you today, I'm so happy that he brought up Ignite the Fire, because the message that I bring to you today is a direct result of Ignite the Fire. I, as he mentioned, I've been preaching there. It's been going on. That meeting's been going on for almost seven years now. And uh, I had already preached a 16-week revival four times a week in that church. And so as you can imagine, I've preached everything I know at least twice. Yeah. And so uh, that Friday morning I had done the Ignite the Lord of the Harvest meeting. And I was sitting at a red light on my way to breakfast. And I said to the Lord, I said, you know, God, they're going to expect me to have something to say to them. And I'm out. It would be so good if you could give me a little inspiration. And said that that red light in Chula Vista, California, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, Research red flags. Now that's an odd thing to tell me. Thank God for good one. <laughs> and so when I got back to the trailer, I got my computer out and I began to take a journey. What I discovered was that the first appearance of a red flag, it was actually a red streamer called a walking since 1602. And they would fly a long red streamer from the mast of their ship. And that long red streamer communicated a very distinct message. This is it. We are prepared.
to fight to the last man. We will never surrender. And you take this ship from the edge of the last man stand. I followed it through and I found out that it began to be hung out as a war cry of defiance from window shields and parapets and the tops of church buildings. And even at the Alamo, Santa Ana ran up a red flag at the top of the highest church to let the Alamo know there'd be no surrender. So I just come by tonight to wonder out if you're hearing. If maybe we couldn't just declare this red flag sign. Just for 
good measure. Put your hands together. Give God an ovation. Let your voice out. Go ahead and shout. Yes to the Lord. I, I want to be direct, but I don't want to be facetious. But I just want to say to you as an evangelist, I've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, I know I don't look like it, but if I live till next week, I'll be 55. I'm feeling every day of it, to be honest with you. But, but at 55, God is still giving me first. Yes. This is my first time to preach for you. It's my first time to preach for Pastor Blizzard. But it's also my first Pentecostal revival service in the state of Nevada. It's my 47th state. I'm pumped. I came here with high expectations. I don't believe that God kept me out of Nevada all this time. Because he was just putting some stuff together. I believe it's going to be a miracle night before we leave. Yes, Anybody else want to leave that? So here in a little while, I'll give you an opportunity. I'll tell you some more about these red flags uh, later in the service and give you an opportunity. And I will apologize in advance. I had no idea that Pastor Lutheran had built up such a beautiful congregation. And so I'm going to tell you now we're going to run out of red flags tonight. So, are you ready? Yeah. Peter was in prison. The Bible describes it quite intricately. He was not just in any old prison, but he was in a lower prison cell. Not only was he in prison, but he was in chains. He was shackled between two captains of the guard. He was a high-level prisoner. Yeah. Right. They weren't intending for him to get loose. And the fact of it is, James had just been beheaded. And Peter was not long for execution. As a matter of fact, I can tell you plainly that come sunrise, there was a very public execution on the books. He was about to lose his head. There was no governor stepped by the red phone to call in and give him a stay. There was no somebody helping me now. NAACP or BLM outside picketing asking for his release. There was nothing between him and the guillotines except the church. Yeah. In the good old USA today, it's good old fashioned, knee bending Christian prayer. Yes. Yeah. Listen, they've driven us out of the schoolhouse, they've kicked us out of the courthouse, they're, they're quickly working to kick us out of the state house. But I wish somebody would go ahead and get with me tonight and just let them know it'll never happen here. Our prayer room is here to stay. We're not ever going to come. It ought to be the prayer. We are swiftly closing in on one of the greatest moments of this century. We are going to elect the next president of the United States who is going to appeal or uh, uh, fill our court with at least two appointees. And you all know, if you know anything about politics, that's going to be a really big day. Yeah. So I don't know. I wouldn't begin to tell you who to vote for. I'm almost scared to even talk about it. Nobody <laughs> here with handcuffs, are there? Yeah. I'm not, listen to me carefully, I'm not being political tonight. In fact, here's where I really came to tell this church. I'm telling the Holy Ghost, 
The Holy Ghost was hard. He, well, I didn't have any choices about what sermon I was going to preach about. And I got some favorites I feel like they're broken out. God's sitting here to tell you that this is a big time in the history of the United States of America. But he does not need the one called apostolic, tongue-talking, heaven-bound believers down at the picket line. He needs you down at the prayer line. You're not going to change the course of history at the picket line. You're going to change it in the prayer line.
to move on. It's my first time. I won't tell anybody about that. <laughs> but see, I've seen too many miracles. All right. I've seen too many blinded eyes open. Deaf ears and stop. I saw, I saw God throw a man's knuckle back in front of my eyes one night. I saw a lady that came in with a withered limb on a walk, literally walked out with her hand hauled and no more walking stick. I'm just saying, he implored to bring a dead man back to life in Walmart one night. In fact, three of the greatest miracles of my ministry happened at Walmart. I've seen the doctors astonished. I've seen tumors disappear. I've seen cancer eradicated. All because somebody prayed. I've seen backslidden children reclaimed. I've seen kids come out of rehab and wind up in homes. I've just not, I've seen a guy that owned me and was in the hospital at 2 a.m. And literally in the middle of my sermon, the Holy Ghost fell on him. And he stood up talking in tongues in the middle of my sermon that afternoon. I'm just telling you, God has still got lots of power. And he's still doing the practice. But he needs somebody to get to the prayer room. And, yeah, so, see too many alcoholics that don't drink anymore. Yeah. I've seen too many drug addicts that quit shooting up. Yes. I've seen too many things quit stealing, liars quit lying, cheaters quit cheating. Yeah. I've seen marriages restored. Yes. Prayer still works. Yeah. I'm challenging this one well apostolic church in Las Vegas, in the heart of Sin City. Rise up and pray. Kneel down and pray. Lay down and pray. Sin, it don't matter. But that's what pasta. Just get in Brings me to my point, I know you're happy to hear that. God opened the door. Yeah. In answer to prayer. Yeah. Now here's the deal. <clears throat> Peter was coming. Right. I mean, when the angel showed up to give him a jailbreak. He was cutting some seeds, folks. <laughs> Listen, he didn't just doze off from a long-term imprisonment. He had rolled up his coat and made a pillow and laid down and was asleep. Yes, sir. Yeah. He wasn't worried about nothing. I mean, if you're going to die tomorrow, at least die resting. She would fight her way out of that chair. She would fight her way down to that altar. And she'd be 
one of the last ones to leave the prayer meeting. came down and grabbed my hand one night, brother Amy. She said, young man, there's a little city out by about 14 miles up the road. They are in desperate need for church. And she said, I just think that you might be the man. Amen. Well, I was pretty sure that that wasn't my call. Because I may have missed it. Maybe why I'm still evangelizing today. I said to her, ma'am, I feel your burden and I understand your passion. I doubt very seriously if God's calling me to that little town. But I want you to know that you have no more reason to worry or carry such a heavy burden for that city. Because I know you and I know your works. And the Bible said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into the field. Can I tell some of you tonight, you're never going to be called to Pakistan. God's not going to send you. Somebody help me out of Russia. Come on, but he might send you to a prayer room to intercede for a city that God can send him out. So when to have 
so wealthy that she had a gate so big and so heavy that rather than be burdened with the continual opening of such an opulent gate, they installed a door in the gate. Right. Right. Oh, the little things. Uh, there's a door in the gate. She's so wealthy that she has a servant who has a singular purpose. Listen for the door. Right? Good job. And so Rhoda is tasked with listening. Yeah. Now, I don't know how long it took for Peter to lose his patience. <laughs> I'm just saying. He was a typical one God apostolic preacher. Yeah, right. Because by the time she got to the door, she didn't need a people to see who was out there. No, it's true. She recognized. Let me tell you what I think he was saying. I know y'all are in there. I heard you praying when I walked up. Somebody opened this door. Somebody. My Bible said, Behold, the Lord standing at the door, knocking, knocking, knocking. And if any man put on when I come to him, he will come in. But 
praise and worship and gladness. You can shout till your hair falls down. You can run till your ankles hurt. You can jump till your knees swell up. But that ain't going to open the door.
I saw your parking lot. and horses anymore. We're, we're, we're driving shiny new cars. We're living in houses where we walk in there and go from heat to air conditioner with one swap. Oh, son of God. We hear some of the greatest preaching week after week, service after service. Somebody help me now. We have greater preachers, greater pastors, greater missions, more, more, more. Hey, we are doing They sent me an email this week from headquarters. We are moving into a building that just a few years ago, the construction cost was $17 million. And oh, by the way, the first 12 or 13 months that we own the place, we're going to make $100,000. Only God can do that. Back to the pastor 
pastor in Michigan. They never quit living for God. They never changed one standard of their lifestyle. And when they got to Utah, they said, Oh God, please let there be a church where we can go to church and they'll come pick us up. And they found a little home missionary pastor there. And this was his prayer that night before he met them. This was his prayer. God, send me some little old saints that can model this message in front of these new conflicts. And then walk behind them all the girls. They're getting ready to turn 83 years old. They have made, now made over 10,000 red flags. So I get those red flags and bring them land out here. Sometimes I throw them out. Sometimes I sell them. I just told you I'm going to pay for it. I'm about $125 into the flags I have today. Shipping them all. So when you come get your red flag, you can leave a few dollars in. It's just to cover the expense. If you're a young person, you don't have any money. Come get one anyway. I'm telling you now, we're going to run. But I don't want you to just come get this red flag and walk away from that. Come on. All right. No, I want you to put it in your body. Tie it on your mirror. Take it to school and put it in your locker. And when somebody says, what's that red flag mean? That means I'm a one dog. Don't talk. Have a pair of believers. And I refuse.
usher just back into the presence of God. If you would come down here, right? And I'm hoping that these young people really lead the charge. Listen, nobody's under attack by the teenagers and the young people of our churches. The world's trying to take them out younger and younger and younger. I mean, used to, we used to fight for our teenagers. Now we're fighting for our nine-year-olds. stand back there and watch them pray. That's all. In fact, I just think we could turn this whole area right here into one big prayer room.